morning, folks. Uh, again, it's about a minute till I uh, start the camera a little early and give us time for folks to join us that may want to. As we prepare for our study today, we're still in uh, what we call the Olivet Discourse. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is the fifth lesson on this Olivet Discourse. Remember, this is the teaching that Jesus gave uh, from the Mount of Olives. Uh, but as I told you, and I want you to always remember this, that Matthew was writing based upon Mark's writing. And I think what Matthew has done, and some may disagree, was to incorporate... Uh, I got a note here from someone... Think it's that important, but I needed to check. Sorry, but as I said, Matthew is incorporating the teachings of Jesus, and many of these teachings were throughout his ministry. You're going to see a, an example of that in today's lesson as well. Um, he was teaching about the end times because the disciples, at some point, had asked him. Now, I happen to believe that some of these teachings have been drawn from other times and, and put in here so that Matthew could gather end times teachings uh, to make a coherent, not chronological, but a coherent lesson. Uh, for example, today we're going to look at a couple of parables. And these parables, I believe, probably came about at different times, not necessarily chronologically with this teaching. But what Matthew's done is he's grabbed parables that relate to end times teachings. You'll see that because there is a another theme that runs through these parables. And like I said, I don't want to get too ahead of myself because I don't know if I'll get to all the parables today, but turn into Matthew chapter 24. I want to finish this chapter right fast uh, and then talk about the parables. In Matthew 24, uh, verse 45, now Jesus has talked to his disciples, given them some of the signs, uh, alluded to rapture even in some of this, and he's his last point was that nobody knows when this is going to happen. And primarily, he, you know, he says, well, only the Father knows. A lot of people thought, well, Jesus and God are one. Why didn't Jesus know? Uh, but I think the reason for that is that he's simply saying that he had determined when to do this because he's allowing us as his servants to witness and to reach out to people that may otherwise be condemned. And... There will come what we call a cutoff, though. There has to be an end to this. Jesus gives chance after chance after chance for people to come to know him. But if they fail to do so, and if they refuse to do so, then, quite frankly, time runs out. So he's talking, and he says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, My master is delayed and starts to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, that servant's master will come on the day he does not expect him at an hour when he does not know. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, pretty sobering thought, but what Jesus is saying is that we are the servants, and we can be faithful and wise servants, or we can be bad servants. Now, as a servant, what has Jesus told us to do? Well, quite simply, he's given us a great commission to go and to share and make disciples of all men. He's given us the mandate to share love with one another, to love other people. And in that, we are to love people as we love ourselves. And some people leave out the accountability part in that. But if I'm going to love you as I love myself, then I'm going to hold you to the same standard I hold myself to, and accountability. And so Jesus is saying, these are good servants. They're feeding the others. And that's alluding to the fact that we are sharing the gospel, that feeding is giving life, and when you share the gospel, you're giving eternal life. Now, 
he says something interesting here. He says, when the master finds his servant doing his job, then he's going to trust him and he's going to reward him with all of his possessions. But, and there's that word where he changes the tone, flips it. If the servant is wicked, if the servant begins to beat his fellow servants, if he begins to eat and drink with drunkards, then the master will come at a time when that servant doesn't expect it. And he doesn't know the hour. And he will be taken. He says, and this, this is pretty graphic when you think about it. This is Jesus talking. Everybody talks about how sweet, loving, and kind Jesus is. Jesus was sweet, loving, and kind, but he was also factual and truthful. And when he talks about judgment, it's, it seems different. Uh, we know that Jesus' compassion and forgiving but when he's given all of the opportunities and it's time to be judged, his just judgment is just. It is a just judgment, if you pardon that. Um, and it says in verse 51, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. Now, who are the hypocrites? Well, look right back over to chapter 23. He talks about the Pharisees, the scribes of the Pharisees. And what did he do? He called them hypocrites, hypocrites multiple times. So he's talking about the people who are bad servants. Now, we take this in context of 23 and 24. He's already spoken to the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests. And he sees these as people that should be the leading servants, the leading teachers. And yet, they're self-centered, just like this wicked servant. They're only interested in getting something to please themselves. And he called them hypocrites over here, and he tells, tells us that this servant... It's just like him. He's a hypocrite. And there's a harsh judgment waiting for him. Uh, he's going to be assigned with these hypocrites, a place for the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's another allusion to the day of the Lord uh, and a reference to hell, really, uh, a place where the, there is the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that's the end of chapter 24, but it's not the end of the Olivet Discourse, but Jesus is going to go into parables. Now, we know Jesus has given a lot of teachings uh, from the Olivet Discourse based on the question the disciples asked. Now, he's going to go into a parable style of teaching. And think about it. When you go hear a sermon, a lot of times you'll hear the teaching aspect, but what you'll take home and remember is the uh, object lesson that's often used. Um, as, a, as a preacher, I always found myself being more of a teacher. I, I did use object lessons, but I, I was more interested in, in the, I guess you'd say, the lecture part of it. Uh, but Jesus was a good teacher, a very good teacher, better than I'll probably ever be. And he knew how to pull in stories that people could relate to. And here's one that we're familiar with, but I want to try to see if I can amplify it a little bit. Chapter 25 starts off with Jesus saying, At that time... The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. And when the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take oil with them, but the wise ones took oil in their flask and with their lamps. When the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, there was a shout, Here comes the groom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise ones, Give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. The wise ones answered, No, there won't be enough for us and for you. Go instead to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. And when they had gone to buy some, the groom arrived, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Now there's more to that, but let's stop and look at this. What Jesus is describing is a very common occurrence, and that's a wedding. You remember his first miracle was performed at a wedding. Uh, a while back, I was in Israel, and I went to the Wailing Wall, and the Wailing Wall is, you go inside what's known as the Dome Gate, and you walk up this hill to an area where you can see the Wailing Wall. On that particular day, I had just come inside the Dome Gate, and there was a sycamore tree sitting by a rock wall, and I was hot and tired, so I went and I sat down on the wall. I knew I had to climb that hill uh, to, to get up to the wailing wall, but I, I was tired. I thought, well, I'm going to sit here. And I'd pulled a muscle in my leg, and so I was just waiting. 
And as I sat there, I heard this music. It was incredible. Uh, I thought Benny Goodman was leading it. They had a clarinet player that's the best I've ever heard. And then there was uh, a drum, and uh, there was a crowd that came not through the dung gate, but through a, a door down below the dung gate. And suddenly this crowd of people came, and they were playing. The musicians were leading the way, and they were playing this wonderful music, and they were dancing. And they came right over to where I was sitting, and there was a sort of an open space there. And they all formed a circle, and they began to dance. And inside the circle, I noticed uh, a man and woman. And I realized that what I was watching was a wedding procession. And the dancing and the jumping up and down, they were so happy in the music. And they danced for a while, and then pretty soon they formed a line. And they had a little shelter on four poles with a, with a cloth that they held over the bride and groom. And they started for the wailing wall. Uh, it was a magical moment, quite frankly. I sat there and I thought, the one time in Israel I didn't have my camera with me. I was going to record the music. It was beautiful. Well, a few minutes later, here came another group with more music. This was a bar mitzvah. A young fellow being hoisted up on someone's shoulders. Candy was being thrown. Uh, they did the same thing. They stopped at the foot of the hill. They danced and went on. And then before I knew it, here came another wedding party. It was like this most of the day. As I sat there, I thought, well, I'm just going to sit right here. I've got a front row seat. I saw at least three weddings come true. And I began to get the idea of this wedding celebration. Uh, but then I began to read more about it. And particularly in the first century, a wedding celebration took place at a house, and it could go on all week. The bride and groom didn't go away. They came to their house, and they would have dinners and parties. And then on the night of the actual wedding ceremony, the bride would go to the house and wait for the groom to appear. Now, while in Israel, I also went to Canaan, where the wedding of Canaan had occurred, where they believed that the actual wedding occurred. Today, there's a church there. But what struck me was, as I was walking up this cobblestone street to get to the church, I noticed that on either side, there were these buildings. That these were homes, I guess. And the street was rather narrow. And as we walked along, I realized that to get into any of these, you had to go in through the door. And when we got to the church, even the door had a courtyard and a gateway that was closed, and you had to go in to get there. And I began to imagine these virgins. Now, they go because two things. It's a wedding party, uh, and like girls do, they like to see other people's weddings, can prepare for their own. And also, there's going to be bachelors there and potential uh, future husbands for them. They, they came for the evening, and it says they went out. They probably had gone into the house where the bride was, but now they knew that the groom was coming. They just didn't know when. So they go out into the street. That's dark. There's no street lights. So, of course, they had their lamps and their oil. Uh, and they wanted to be there to receive the bridegroom. Just like we think about the second coming as we do this study, we think we want to be ready for Jesus to return. And when Jesus comes, he's going to be like a bridegroom coming. The problem is we don't know when he's coming. Well, they didn't either. So they had their laps. It was nighttime. And I'll tell you, people say, well, why at nighttime? I read in a Jewish custom book that sometimes it was the bride's uh, or the groom's idea was to surprise the bride, which meant he could come during the day or during the night. And sometimes he'd come at night because he would think everybody's going to be sleeping. He would spring the big surprise. That could explain why. Because everybody was anticipating the coming groom. Uh, but they didn't know when. And so they had to sort of make a choice. Is he coming in the daytime? We'll be ready. Is he coming at night? We better get ready. These virgins had gone out into the street to wait for the groom and be prepared. Now, another interesting thing it says here uh, in verse... Six in the middle of the night, there was a shout. That's because the groom always sent his herald ahead of him, and the herald would go. And when he came to where the bride's or the bride and groom's house would be, he would shout, "The groom is coming!" Now let's look at that in the life of Jesus. Jesus had a herald. His name was John the Baptist, and John came before Jesus, and he announced, "He's coming." 
this is the same analogy because Jesus used the analogy of the, of the bride and, and the groom and, the, and the, the, the whole wedding analogy for the second coming. So here are these girls out. It says that they were waiting in the middle of the night. They had trimmed their lamps. Now the smart ones had basically doused their lamps to save their oil. The others were still in this party mode. Uh, and I was reading about a guy who was there in Israel one time and saw a wedding like this. And as he, he came to the wedding, he found that people were dancing in the streets. As the sun was going down, it was evening. And they were holding their, their lights, and they had, some, well, they had some street lights then, but they, were, they had flashlights and shining around. And they were dancing and laughing and having a good time. And I thought about these ten virgins. They didn't have street lights. They had their lamps. So the smart ones decided, well, we're going to trim our lamp and be ready. The others, they were in full party mode. They had their lamps burning. They were dancing and laughing. Uh, because the wedding was all about them, not about the, the couple. And so a shout comes. The groom is coming. Well, when the groom is coming, the five smart virgins light their lamps. The other girls suddenly realize they didn't bring the oil with them. And they'd used most of their oil. And now their lamps are going out. In other words, they wouldn't be able to light the path. They wouldn't be able to celebrate with the groom. And so they said, give us some oil. And the other said, no, if we give you some of ours, we won't have enough for us either. You need to go buy some. Well, middle of the night, they got to go find someone who sells oil. But five virgins take off. The lessons here are pretty clear. Uh, we're talking about the second coming of Christ. And it's saying that we should be ready. Remember, Jesus had made a reference over in chapter 24 um, in verse 18 or in verse 17. He says, it's going to be like the days of Noah. And what did he say they were doing? Well, they were drinking and marrying, getting in marriage. You know, they were having a party. And they weren't ready for the flood. Jesus uses that to compare this now to the wedding and saying these girls were more into the party. They weren't seriously waiting for the groom. They were just having a good time, and they missed it. Uh, the other thing it teaches us is that other than just being ready and being prepared and being watchful, which Jesus stressed, there's one other thing here, and it's simply this. Down there where they say, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out, there's a clear message being sent there, and it's this. I can be saved but you can't go to heaven on my salvation. You can't take my salvation and apply it to you. You have to have your own, just like oil. I can't give you my oil for your, for your lamp. You have to have your own oil. Oil, in this case, becomes representative of salvation and relationship. I have a relationship with God. If you don't, then you're like a virgin who has no oil. You need that relationship. You cannot borrow a relationship from someone else. Uh, I've, I've been in situations where families, you know, the, the grandmother or the mother or father be saved and the children think, well, they say, our children are good. You know, we have good kids. And I know this sounds harsh. It's one of the biggest criticisms of Christianity. But the Bible's pretty clear that it doesn't matter who your father or mother is. It doesn't matter how good you are. You know, that's called moral relativity. When I, when I come to God and I say, Look, God, I've kept your commandments. I'm, I'm a good guy. Well, let me in heaven. What's Jesus going to say? He said, uh, Well, I'll, let me tell you what he's going to say because it's right here. When it says the door was shut, in verse 11, it says, Later, the rest of the virgins came. They'd been to get them some oil. They came back. And they said, Master, Master, open up for us. In other words, let us in. He replied, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore be alert, because you don't know either the day or the hour, is how that little section ends. But what I want to do is point out that phrase, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Now, this is an important phrase, because Jesus used it often. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead. Look over... Um, at the sheep and goats around verse 31 says when the son of man comes his glory 
you know, this is another section where Jesus is telling the story about sheep and goats. But if you look in there, um, in verse 41, it says, Then he will say also to those on the left, Depart from me, you're cursed, that you're eternal fire for forever, the devil's angels for you. you know, he's telling them, Go away. Here he says, Go away. Where does this come from? Jesus had another teaching. I find it interesting Matthew didn't include it, but to me this is the what I call the scariest verse in the Bible. I'm going to turn to it. Uh, it's back in Matthew chapter 7, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, in verse 22 and 23, I'm pretty sure you've probably heard this, but I want you to think about the fact that this wasn't the first time Jesus is going to use this, this, this phrase, but it should send a shudder particularly when you read it in chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. It says, On that day, now we're talking about end time, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, do many miracles in your name? In verse 23, Then I will announce to them, Jesus talking, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. That is a scary verse in the Bible. But what it's doing is simply saying what Jesus said all along. If you want to be part of my kingdom, you have to know the king. If you want to come in, you have to know the person whose home you're coming into. Jesus tells them there, go away. I never knew you. And that's not his fault. Jesus has spent an eternity literally trying to reveal and get to know us. But we've rejected him. And what happens when we reject him? He says, say, I tried to get to know you, but I never knew you because you never took the time to know me. We have no relationship. Now, as we look at these passages here, it's echoed again. Uh, in the story here of the virgins, there's ten virgins and five of them are prepared. Five of them are have their lamps. Five of them are going in. Five are... Basically, all in it for themselves. And Jesus says, what? I don't know who you are. But let us in, Master. Let us come to heaven. I'm sorry. You can't come in. I don't know you. Over here in the sheep and goat judgment where he's talking about how he's in prison and all this stuff. He, he's talking about all the opportunities they had to, to know him. And, and some of these are, you know, they're not the most pleasant things. He's saying, I was hungry. I was a stranger. I was naked. I was in prison. Where were you? Well, you didn't come to me when I was hungry or a stranger or naked in prison. So I never got to know you. And I don't know you. We don't have a relationship. Now, to amplify this again, Jesus goes into another parable right after that. And you, you're probably familiar with this one. It's called the parable of the talents. At verse 14, it says, We're just like a man about to go on a journey. Jesus was going on a journey. His disciples may not have realized that until they saw him ascend into heaven, but Jesus was leaving. And he called his own servants, and he entrusted the possessions to them. And he went on his journey immediately. Now, we know that he gives some talents. Uh, we think talents, that's money. Actually, talents is weight. It's not money, it's a, it's a weight. And what he's saying is that he gave one a lot of responsibility, one a little less responsibility, and one he gave barely any responsibility. Um, and so when he comes back, in verse 19, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. Now, what it means is uh, he's asking, with your responsibility, how did you use that gift and that responsibility? Verse 10 says, The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more. And the master gave me five. I've earned five more. Master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll put you in charge of many. The man who had given two talents approached, and he said, Master, you gave me two talents. I've earned two more. The master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, take notice here. One guy returns five for five. Another guy's two for two. You think, well... The guy who did two for two, for two uh, if he should have made five also, you know, if he could do that. But what, what it's saying is that Jesus gives all of us gifts. 
and he expects a return on our gifts, but he doesn't expect us all uh, to be the greatest preacher, teacher. You know, it's like Billy Graham. People consider Billy Graham one of the greatest evangelists because he reached out to a billion people. Well, what if the preacher who's standing in the pulpit of a little country church with maybe 70 members, is he less in the eyes of God? This man preaches and millions of people are saved. This little preacher in the country preaches and maybe one or two people are saved. Does God look down on him and say, well, I'm going to give Billy Graham a mansion. You, you, you didn't hardly do anything. No. Jesus is saying, I give you a position. I give you a skill. I give you a talent. And you, we don't always know what part we play in God's plan. There's all these wonderful stories. Uh, there was one about a guy who was dying. A little old man was dying. And uh, he said, I've never done anything. And it turns out he had witnessed to people on the street, but he'd never had a church, never accomplished anything. And yet a man showed up and said, no, because of you, I was saved. It turns out that guy, I think it was Dwight Moody, who went on to, you know, be a major evangelist. And so the little guy who saved him thought he had accomplished nothing when in fact he'd been a essential link in the chain. You can be and you may be an essential link in God's chain. We don't know. We're just called to be faithful and to be ready, to be watchful and to be working. Uh, sometimes we feel that we have no purpose, our life has no meaning. But God says, if I give you purpose and meaning, you have the ultimate purpose and meaning. Stop playing the world's game. The world's game says if you're not the best at something, you're, you're nothing. I, I got so angry when my kids were uh, playing ball. They were children. And I'd hear a coach say, remember, second place is the first loser. And I thought, don't say that. Let these kids enjoy, and they're working hard. Whether they win every game or lose every game, they were working hard. They were enjoying it. They were benefiting from it. And yet these coaches come along screaming like they want to be Vince Lombardi or Leo DeRocher, and they're just screaming about, oh, you got to be number one. You can't be number two. You know, you're losers. There are no losers in God's kingdom. There are some that have been given certain responsibilities that are, that are great, and we look to them and we admire them, but we should never compare ourselves to them because what God has given us is just as important. Get on the soapbox. Have to be careful. But in this... It finally comes to the lazy servant, the wicked one. The man who received one talent approached the master. He says, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown, gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went off and I put your talent in the ground so that you have what was yours. And his master replied, you evil, lazy servant. If you knew all that about me, you should have at least invested in the bank. So take the talent from him, give it to the one who has ten, for everyone who has more will be given, and he will have I'm reading, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has, has will be taken from him. And throw this good for nothing servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Seems harsh. A lot of people said, Whoa, that's awful mean. The guy just didn't want to take a chance. Well, what the guy is actually doing is showing his lack of faith in God. If God gives you something to do, do it. You may not see the results that you expect. You know, um, I preached a revival one time in Texas. And it was at a private boarding school that I taught at. There were 400 students. The last night of the revival, I gave an invitation. And 400 people came forward. There were so many people I had to ask some college students that were there and some other ministers there to help out listening. I was on such a super high. I thought, oh man, I'm going to be an evangelist. I, I thought that was one night in my life. Never had one like it again. I preached in church and gone for weeks and weeks where nobody would come forward. And I thought, oh man, I've lost it. But did I ever have it? No. God had it. God used me to send a message to work in the hearts of those kids that night. And ever since then, God uses us to send a message to who he wants to hear it. And I don't know who benefits from what I say, but I trust God because God is the author, not me. I'm not writing this stuff. He's already written it. The point is, be faithful. Keep doing. Don't look for results. A faithful servant does the work. 
uh, I hate to use this analogy, but it's why I'm bad at golf. When I played golf, I used to play every day. My dad would go out on the golf course. The first thing he'd tell me after I hit the ball, he'd say, son, keep your head down. Stop looking for the ball. He said, look at where the ball is at and hit it. Don't try to see where it's going. And I thought, there's a religious lesson in there. Because so often we're more interested in what we accomplish than what we do. In golf, you hit the ball. Then you look to see where the ball went. In life, we do the job. Then we look to see, did it work out for someone? But we don't take our merit based upon the results. That's what the world teaches us. It's not what God teaches us. God's clearly said, be working. When I come, I want to find you doing it. Not looking, not packing bags, but doing it. And from there, from that little point, and I have to point out too, look what he says. He says, this good-for-nothing servant, throw him into outer darkness. What is outer darkness? Well, it's another phrase that refers to hell. Now, this seems harsh. People think, oh, man, Jesus is throwing everybody in hell. No, Jesus is not. Jesus is letting these people make their bed in hell because they did not listen. They didn't have a relationship with God. They didn't do the will of God. They didn't serve God. They didn't follow God. What does it expect for them except darkness? And again, he says, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Same thing he said at the end of chapter 24 over there. Uh, we need to look for these similarities because Jesus has a pretty plain message. He said, I would rather you not experience this, but it's in your hands. I'm not going to force you to be saved. But if you choose not to, all that waits for you is darkness, hell, and sorrow, and the gnashing of teeth. Now, I'm going to stop there because I want to I want to do the sheep and goats story next week because this is the last part of the Olivet Discourse. This is what Matthew uh, concludes with uh, because chapter 26 begins with the words when Jesus had finished all these things. So we're going to finish the Olivet Discourse next week. Now, uh, one announcement. If you want to see these lessons or if you missed one, we've had five now. Uh, what I've done is i put them on YouTube. I've got a page on YouTube. And so you go into YouTube, you type in L. Brooks Walker, and it'll bring you up to my page. There's a little circular picture of a crusader on a horse. I, I like it because the old man looked like me at one point. I guess he still does. But if you click on that, uh, it'll bring you to my page, and then you go to videos, you'll see all these. I've got all the lessons on there. Actually, I have one that goes all the way back to the beginning of this broadcast when we are doing Hebrews, but... When I tried to put all of the Hebrews lessons on there, they had degraded and they were gone. So there's only one Hebrews. But they're numbered uh, end time study, one, two, three, four, five. Um, but they're not in order. I wish they were, but for some reason when they went in, it's like four, five, three, two, one, or something like that. But if you want to go back and look at them, you can. Um, I forgot to mention to people here, these are Sunday school lessons, because I've had a couple of people look at the videos, and they probably thought, oh, this is some crazy guy teaching Sunday school. But if you want to look, they're on YouTube, on the L. Brooks Walker page, and under videos called End Times uh, Study. Um, I'll still have it on Facebook, but like I say, I'm shifting things into YouTube so that it'll last longer, quite frankly. Um, now, that is for you if you want that. The other thing is uh, two points, I guess I should say. We're going to have a word of prayer before I let you go. Remember that uh, First Baptist Lancaster here in Lancaster is broadcasting our services. Randall Hatcher, our pastor, will be giving a sermon uh, at 11 o'clock. And so you can go to Facebook and stream that live. Uh, it starts usually just a moment or two before 11. I encourage you to do that. I also encourage you to find your own church online. If you don't feel comfortable going to church, uh, most churches right now are online. If not, there's plenty online that you can, can visit uh, and enjoy the worship service. But also you can go to your church, even though there are some people trying to say, stay out of church, it's dangerous. In California, they, they don't let them sing. It's bizarre. Uh, but ours comes up here at First Baptist Church, Lancaster, at 11 o'clock, Randall Hatcher. Uh, you might enjoy that. Now, uh, I want you to think about prayer requests. Uh, 
we have our, our usual prayer requests we've listed. Um, I'm not going to go through a list of the names right now because I, I want to get right to our prayer. But you know the needs, but more importantly, God knows the needs. So let us pray God's will be done in the lives of those who are sick, that are hurting, that are scared, depressed, that mourn, um, that God can strengthen them, that we can be a channel to help them remember that put your faith in God because he is faithful. Now, let's have a word of prayer. We'll let you go and get ready for going to church. Heavenly Father, I come to you to say, first, to offer you my praise and my thanks. Lord, my words are so limited. I can never praise you enough for all that you've done. But as I've said so many times, if I am blessed in no other way for the rest of my life, I have received more blessings than I have deserved. And the blessing of your salvation, the relationship we have, is the greatest blessing of all. I need nothing else, Lord. So I thank you. And I praise you that you are a God that reaches out and that loves us. And I would pray that, Lord, that there are many that would begin that relationship with you, that would open their hearts to your presence and your spirit. Lord, as I said a moment ago, you know the needs of the listeners. You know the needs of our friends and families, those that are sick and hurting and sad and all those other negative adjectives. So God, our desire would be to fix everything, but your desire is greater and your will is perfect. So Lord, I pray and I hope that others join me in this prayer that your will be done in all things. For Lord, you are perfect in your will. We may not always understand it because, as you said, your ways are different than our ways. Your thoughts are different than our thoughts. So, Lord, let us humble ourselves to be your servants, ever watchful, ever working. Forgive us of our weaknesses, Lord. Forgive us of our failures. Help us, God, to stand strong in the faith and in your service. Lord, in that way, as I like to say, you will make us the people that you want us to be. And let that be our prayer today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I thank you again for being with me on this lesson and, and all those who've listened in. I hope it's been beneficial. Uh, let's move on now. It's about time for church in an hour or so. So, God bless you and be with you. And I'll see you here next Sunday morning at 9.30. This is that time where I always have a hard time turning it off.